This is taken from my weekly podcast called Down to Sleep, where I softly read books to you to help you get a good night's rest. Before I tuck you in, please hit that like button, as it helps me know that you enjoy these videos. If you'd like to hear more, all the links that you need are in the description. Enjoy. Chapter 16 The Magic Art of the Great Humbug Next morning, the Scarecrow said to his friends, Congratulate me. I'm going to Oz to get my brains at last. When I return, I shall be as other men are. I have always liked you as you were, said Dorothy simply. It is kind of you to like a scarecrow, he replied, but surely you will think more of me when you hear the splendid thoughts my new brain is going to turn out. Then he said goodbye to them all in a cheerful voice and went to the throne room, where he rapped upon the door. Come in, said Oz. The scarecrow went in and found a little man sitting down by the window engaged in deep thought. I've come for my brains, remarked the scarecrow a little uneasily. Oh yes, sit down in that chair, please, replied Oz. You must excuse me for taking your head off, but I shall have to do it in order to put your brains in their proper place. Well, that's all right, said the scarecrow. You're quite welcome to take my head off as long as it'll be a better one when you put it on again. So the wizard unfastened his head and emptied out the straw. Then he entered the back room and took up a measure of bran, which he mixed with a great many pins and needles. Having shaken them together thoroughly, he filled the top of the scarecrow's head with the mixture and stuffed the rest of the space with straw to hold it in place. When he had fastened the scarecrow's head on his body again, he said to him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. The scarecrow was both pleased and proud at the fulfilment of his greatest wish. Having thanked Oz warmly, he went back to his friends. Dorothy looked at him curiously. His head was quite bulged out at the top with brains. How do you feel? she asked. I feel wise indeed, he answered earnestly. When I get used to my brains, I shall know everything. Why are those needles and pins sticking out of your head? asked the tin woodman. That's proof that he is sharp, remarked the lion. Well, I must go to Oz and get my heart, said the woodman. So he walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, called Oz. And the woodman entered and said, I've come for my heart. Very well, answered the little man. But I shall have to cut a hole in your breast, so I can put your heart in the right place. I hope it won't hurt you. Oh no, answered the woodman. I shall not feel it at all. So Oz brought a pair of tin smith shears and cut a small square hole in the left side of the tin woodman's breast. Then, going to a chest of drawers, he took out a pretty heart, made entirely of silk and stuffed with sawdust. Isn't it a beauty? he asked. It is indeed, replied the woodman, who was greatly pleased. But is it a kind heart? Oh, very, answered Oz. He put the heart in the woodman's breast and replaced the square of tin, soldering it neatly together where it had been cut. There, said he, now you have a heart that any man might be proud of. I'm sorry I had to put a patch on your breast, but it really couldn't be helped. Never mind the patch, explained the happy woodman. I'm very grateful to you, and shall never forget your kindness. Don't speak of it, replied Oz. The tin woodman went back to his friends, who wished him every joy on account of his good fortune. The lion now walked to the throne room and knocked at the door. Come in, said Oz. I've come for my courage, announced the lion, entering the room. Very well, answered the little man. I will get it for you. He went to a cupboard and, reaching up to a high shelf, took down a square green bottle, the contents of which he poured into a green gold dish beautifully carved. Placing this before the cowardly lion, who sniffed at it as if he did not like it, the wizard said, Drink. What is it? asked the lion. Well, answered Oz, if it were inside of you, it would be courage. You know, of course, that courage is always inside one, so that this really cannot be called courage until you have swallowed it. Therefore I advise you to drink it as soon as possible. The lion hesitated no longer, but drank till the dish was empty. How do you feel now? asked Oz. Full of courage, replied the lion, who went joyfully back to his friends to tell them of his good fortune. Oz, left to himself, smiled to think of his success in giving the scarecrow and the tin woodman and the lion exactly what they thought they wanted. How can I help being a humbug, he said. 
when all these people make me do things that everybody knows can't be done. It was easy to make the Scarecrow and the Lion and the Woodman happy, because they imagined I could do anything. But it will take more than imagination to carry Dorothy back to Kansas, and I am sure I don't know how it can be done. Chapter 17 How the Balloon Was Launched For three days Dorothy heard nothing from Oz. These were sad days for the little girl, although her friends were all quite happy and contented. The Scarecrow told them there were wonderful thoughts in his head, but he would not say what they were because he knew no one could understand them but himself. When the Tin Woodman walked about, he felt his heart rattling around in his breast, and he told Dorothy he had discovered it to be a kinder and more tender heart than one he had owned when he was made of flesh. The lion declared that he was afraid of nothing on earth, and would gladly face an army or a dozen of the fierce Kaladars. Thus, each of the little party was satisfied except Dorothy, who longed more than ever to get back to Kansas. On the fourth day, to her great joy, Oz sent for her, and when she entered the throne room he greeted her pleasantly. Sit down, my dear, I think I have found a way to get you out of this country. And back to Kansas, she asked eagerly. Well, I'm not sure about Kansas, said Oz, for I haven't the faintest notion which way it lies, but the first thing to do is to cross the desert, and then it should be easy to find your way home. How can I cross the desert, she inquired. Well, I'll tell you what I think, said the little man. You see, when I came to this country, it was in a balloon. You also came through the air being carried by a cyclone, so I believe the best way to get across the desert will be through the air. Now it is quite beyond my powers to make a cyclone, but I've been thinking the matter over and I believe I can make a balloon. How? asked Dorothy. A balloon, said Oz, is made of silk, which is coated with glue to keep the gas in it. I have plenty of silk in the palace, so it will be no trouble to make the balloon. But in all this country there is no gas to fill the balloon with, to make it float. If it won't float, remarked Dorothy, it will be of no use to us. True, answered Oz, but there is another way to make it float, which is to fill it with hot air. Hot air isn't as good as gas, for if the air should get cold the balloon would come down in the desert and we should be lost. We, exclaimed the girl, are you going with me? Yes, of course, replied Oz. I'm tired of being such a humbug. If I should go out of this palace, my people would soon discover I am not a wizard. And then they would be vexed with me for having deceived them. So I have to stay shut up in these rooms all day, and it gets tiresome. I'd much rather go back to Kansas with you and be in a circus again. Well, I shall be glad to have your company, said Dorothy. Thank you, he answered. Now if you will help me sew the silk together, we will begin to work on our balloon." So Dorothy took a needle and thread, and as fast as Oz cut the strips of silk into proper shape, the girl sewed them neatly together. First there was a strip of light green silk, then a strip of dark green, and then a strip of emerald green, for Oz had a fancy to make the balloon in different shades of the colour about them. It took three days to sew all the strips together, but when it was finished they had a big bag of green silk more than twenty feet long. Then Oz painted it on the inside with a coat of thin glue to make it airtight, after which he announced that the balloon was ready. But we must have a basket to ride in, he said. So he sent the soldier with the green whiskers for a big clothes basket which he fastened with many ropes to the bottom of the balloon. When it was all ready, Oz sent word to his people that he was going to make a visit to a great brother wizard who lived in the clouds. The news spread rapidly throughout the city, and everyone came to see the wonderful sight. Oz ordered the balloon carried out in front of the palace, and the people gazed upon it with much curiosity. The tin woodman had chopped a big pile of wood, and now he made a fire of it. Oz held the bottom of the balloon over the fire so that the hot air that arose from it would be caught in the silken bag. Gradually, the balloon swelled out and rose into the air, until finally the basket just touched the ground. Then Oz got into the basket and said to all the people in a loud voice, 
I am now going away to make a visit. While I am gone, the Scarecrow will rule over you. I command you to obey him as you would me. The balloon was by this time tugging hard at the rope that held it to the ground, for the air within it was hot, and this made it so much lighter in weight than air without that it pulled hard to rise into the sky. Come, Dorothy, cried the wizard. Hurry up, or the balloon will fly away. I can't find Toto anywhere, replied Dorothy, who did not wish to leave her little dog behind. Toto had run into the crowd to bark at a kitten. Dorothy at last found him. She picked him up and ran towards the balloon. She was within a few steps of it. Oz was holding out his hands to help her into the basket when crack. Crack went the ropes and the balloon rose into the air without her. Come back, she screamed. I want to go too. I can't come back, my dear, called Oz from the basket. Goodbye. Goodbye, shouted everyone, and all eyes were turned upward to where the wizard was riding in the basket, rising every moment farther and farther into the sky. And that was the last that any of them ever saw of Oz the Wonderful Wizard, though he may have reached Omaha safely and be there now for all we know. But the people remembered him lovingly and said to one another, Oz was always our friend. When he was here, he built for us this beautiful emerald city. Now he is gone. He has left the wise scarecrow to rule over us. Still, for many days they grieved over the loss of the wonderful wizard and would not be comforted. Chapter 18 Away to the South Dorothy wept bitterly at the passing of her hope to get home to Kansas again. But when she thought it all over, she was glad she had not gone up in the balloon. She also felt sorry at losing Oz, and so did her companions. The Tin Woodman came to her and said, Truly, I should be ungrateful if I failed to mourn for the man who gave me my lovely heart. I should like to cry a little, because Oz is gone, if you will kindly wipe away my tears, so that I shall not rust. With pleasure, she answered, and brought a towel at once. Then the Tin Woodman wept for several minutes. She watched the tears carefully and wiped them away with the towel. When he had finished, he thanked her kindly and oiled himself thoroughly with his jeweled oil can to guard against mishap. The Scarecrow was now the ruler of the Emerald City, and although he was not a wizard, the people were proud of him, for, they said, there is not another city in the world that is ruled by a stuffed man, and so far as they knew, they were quite right. The morning after the balloon had gone up with Oz, the four travellers met in the throne room and talked matters over. The scarecrow sat in a big throne, and the others stood respectfully before him. "'We are not so unlucky,' said the new ruler. "'This palace and the Emerald City belong to us, and we can do just as we please. When I remember that a short time ago I was up on a pole in a farmer's cornfield, and now I'm the ruler of this beautiful city, I'm quite satisfied with my lot.' "'I also,' said the Tin Woodman." I'm well pleased with my new heart. Really, that was the only thing I wished for in all the world. For my part, I'm content in knowing I am as brave as any beast that ever lived, if not braver, said the lion modestly. If Dorothy would only be contented to live in the Emerald City, continued the Scarecrow, we might all be happy together. But I don't want to live here, cried Dorothy. I want to go to Kansas, and live with Aunt Em and Uncle Henry. Well, what can be done, inquired the woodman. The Scarecrow decided to think, and he thought so hard that the pins and needles began to stick out of his brain. Finally, he said, Why not call the winged monkeys and ask them to carry you over the desert? I never thought of that, said Dorothy joyfully. It's just the thing. I'll go at once for the golden cap. When she brought it into the throne room, she spoke the magic words and soon the band of winged monkeys flew in through the open window and stood beside her. "'This is the second time you have called us,' said the monkey king, bowing before the little girl. "'What do you wish?' "'I want you to fly with me to Kansas,' said Dorothy. The monkey king shook his head. "'That cannot be done,' he said. "'We belong to this country alone and cannot leave it. There has never been a winged monkey in Kansas yet.' I suppose there never will be, for they don't belong there. We shall be glad to serve you in any way in our power, but we cannot cross the desert. Goodbye. 
and with another bow the Monkey King spread his wings and flew away through the window, followed by all his band. Dorothy was ready to cry with disappointment. I wasted the charm of the golden cap to no purpose, she said, for the winged monkeys cannot help me. It is certainly too bad, said the tender-hearted woodman. The scarecrow was thinking again, and his head bulged out so horribly that Dorothy feared it would burst. Let us call in the soldier with the green whiskers, he said. Let's ask his advice. The soldier was summoned and entered the throne room timidly, for while Oz was alive, he was never allowed to come further than the door. This little girl, said the scarecrow to the soldier, wishes to cross the desert. How can she do so? I cannot tell, answered the soldier. Nobody has ever crossed the desert, unless it is Oz himself. Is there no one who can help me? asked Dorothy earnestly. Glinda might, he suggested. Who's Glinda? inquired the scarecrow. The witch of the south. She is the most powerful of all the witches and rules over the quadlings. Besides, her castle stands on the edge of the desert, so she may know a way to cross it. Glinda is a good witch, isn't she? asked the child. The quadlings think she's good, said the soldier. She's kind to everyone. I've heard Glinda is a beautiful woman who knows how to keep young in spite of the many years she's lived. How can I get to her castle? asked Dorothy. The road is straight to the south, he answered. But it is said to be full of dangers to travellers, wild beasts in the woods, a race of queer men who don't like strangers to cross their country. For this reason, none of the quadlings ever come to the Emerald City. The soldier left them, and the scarecrow said, Well, it seems in spite of dangers, the best thing Dorothy can do is travel to the land of the south and ask Linda to help her. For, of course, if Dorothy stays here, she'll never get back to Kansas. You must have been thinking again, remarked the Tin Woodman. I have, said the Scarecrow. I shall go with Dorothy, declared the Lion. I'm tired of your city. I long for the woods and the country again. I'm really a wild beast, you know. Besides, Dorothy will need someone to protect her. That is true, agreed the Woodman. My axe may be of service to her, so I also will go with her to the land of the south. When shall we start? asked the Scarecrow. Are you going? they asked in surprise. Certainly. If it wasn't for Dorothy, I should never have had brains. She lifted me from the pole in the cornfield and brought me to the Emerald City. My good luck is all due to her, and I shall never leave her until she starts back to Kansas for good and all. Thank you, said Dorothy gratefully. You are all very kind to me. I should like to start as soon as possible. We shall go tomorrow morning, returned the Scarecrow. Now let us all get ready, for it will be a long journey. Chapter 19 Attacked by the Fighting Trees The next morning Dorothy kissed the pretty green girl goodbye, and they all shook hands with the soldier with the green whiskers, who had walked with them as far as the gate. When the guardian of the gate saw them again, he wondered greatly that they could leave this beautiful city and get into new trouble. But he at once unlocked their spectacles, which he put back into the green box and gave them many good wishes to carry with them. You are now our ruler, he said to the scarecrow, so you must come back to us as soon as possible. I certainly shall if I'm able, the scarecrow replied. I must help Dorothy get home first. As Dorothy bade the good-natured guardian a last farewell, she said, I have been very kindly treated in your lovely city, and everyone has been good to me. I cannot tell you how grateful I am. Don't try, my dear, he answered. We should like to keep you with us, but if it's your wish to return to Kansas, I hope you will find a way. He opened the gate of the outer walls, and they walked forth and started upon their journey. The sun shone brightly as our friends turned their faces towards the land of the south. They were all in the best of spirits and laughed and chatted together. Dorothy was once more filled with the hope of getting home. The scarecrow and the tin woodman were glad to be of use to her. As for the lion, he sniffed the fresh air with delight and whisked his tail from side to side in pure joy at being in the country again while Toto ran around them and chased moths and butterflies, barking merrily all the time. "'City life does not agree with me at all,' remarked the lion as they walked along at a brisk pace. "'I have lost much flesh since I lived there. 
Now I'm anxious to show the other beasts how courageous I have grown. They now turned and took a last look at the Emerald City. All they could see was a mass of towers and steeples behind the green walls, and high up above everything the spires and dome of the Palace of Oz. Oz was not such a bad wizard after all, said the Tin Woodman as he felt his heart rattling around in his breast. He knew how to give me some brains, and very good brains too, said the Scarecrow. If Oz had taken a dose of the same courage he gave me, added the lion, he would have been a brave man. Dorothy said nothing. Oz had not kept the promise he made her, but he had done his best. So she forgave him. As he said, he was a good man, even if he was a bad wizard. The first day's journey was through the green fields and bright flowers that stretched about the Emerald City on every side. They slept that night on the grass with nothing but the stars over them, and they rested very well indeed. In the morning they travelled on until they came to a thick wood. There was no way of going around it, for it seemed to extend to the right and left as far as they could see. And besides, they did not dare change the direction of their journey for fear of getting lost. So they looked for the place where it would be easiest to get into the forest. The scarecrow who was in the lead finally discovered a big tree with such wide-spreading branches that there was room for the party to pass underneath. He walked forward to the tree, but just as he came under the first branches, they bent down and twined around him, and the next minute he was raised from the ground and flung headlong among his fellow travellers. This did not hurt the scarecrow, but it surprised him, and he looked rather dizzy when Dorothy picked him up. Here is another space between the trees, called the lion. Well, let me try it first, said the scarecrow. It doesn't hurt me to get thrown about. He walked up to another tree as he spoke, but its branches immediately seized him and tossed him back again. This is strange, exclaimed Dorothy. What shall we do? The trees seem to have made their minds up to fight us and stop our journey, remarked the lion. I believe I will try it myself, said the woodman. Shouldering his axe, he marched up to the first tree that had handled the scarecrow so roughly. When a big branch bent down to seize him, the woodman chopped at it so fiercely that he cut it in two. At once the tree began shaking all of its branches as if in pain, and the tin woodman passed safely under it. Come on, he shouted to the others, be quick. They all ran forward and passed under the tree without injury except Toto, who was caught by a small branch and shaken until he howled. The woodman promptly chopped off the branch and set the little dog free. The other trees of the forest did nothing to keep them back. They made up their minds that only the first row of trees could bend down their branches. Probably these were the policemen of the forest, given this wonderful power to keep strangers out. The four travellers walked with ease through the trees until they came to the farther edge of the wood. To their surprise, they found before them a high wall which seemed to be made of white china. It was smooth, like the surface of a dish, higher than their heads. What shall we do now? asked Dorothy. I'll make a ladder, said the Tin Woodman. We certainly must climb over the wall. Chapter 20 The Dainty China Country while the woodman was making a ladder from wood which he found in the forest, Dorothy lay down and slept, for she was tired by the long walk. The lion also curled himself up to sleep, and Toto lay beside him. The scarecrow watched the woodman while he worked, and said to him, I cannot think why this wall is here, nor what it's made of. Rest your brains, do not worry about the wall, replied the woodman. When we have climbed over it, we shall know what is on the other side. After a time, the ladder was finished. It looked clumsy, but the Tin Woodman was sure it was strong and would answer their purpose. The Scarecrow waked Dorothy and the Lion and Toto, and told them that the ladder was ready. The Scarecrow climbed up over the ladder first, but he was so awkward that Dorothy had to follow close behind and keep him from falling off. When he got his head over the top of the wall, the Scarecrow said, Oh my! Go on, exclaimed Dorothy. The scarecrow climbed farther up and sat down on top of the wall. Dorothy put her head over and cried, Oh my, just as the scarecrow had done. Toto came up and immediately began to bark. 
but Dorothy made him be still. The lion climbed the ladder next, and the tin woodman came last, but both of them cried, Oh my! When they were all sitting in a row on top of the wall, they looked down and saw a strange sight. Before them was a great stretch of country, having floor as smooth and shining and white as the bottom of a big platter. Scattered around were many houses made entirely of china, painted in the brightest colors. These houses were quite small, the biggest of them reaching only as high as Dorothy's waist. There were also pretty little barns with china fences around them, many cows and sheep and horses and pigs and chickens, all made of china, standing about in groups. But the strangest of all were the people who lived in this queer country. There were milkmaids and shepherdesses with brightly colored bodices and golden spots all over their gowns, princesses with the most gorgeous frocks of silver and gold and purple, shepherds dressed in knee breeches with pink and yellow and blue stripes down them, golden buckles on their shoes, princes with jeweled crowns upon their heads wearing ermine robes and satin doublets, funny clowns in ruffled gowns with round red spots upon their cheeks and tall pointed caps. Strangest of all, these people were all made of china, even to their clothes, and were so small that the tallest of them was no higher than Dorothy's knee. No one did so much as look at the travellers at first except one little purple china dog with an extra large head, which came to the wall and barked at them in a tiny voice, afterwards running away again. How shall we get down? asked Dorothy. They found the ladder so heavy they could not pull it up. The scarecrow fell off the wall, and the others jumped down upon him so that the hard floor would not hurt their feet. Of course, they took pains not to light on his head and get the pins in their feet. When all were safely down, they picked up the scarecrow, whose body was quite flattened out, and patted his straw into shape again. We must cross this strange place in order to get to the other side, said Dorothy. It would be unwise for us to go any other way except due south. They began walking through the country of the China people, and the first thing they came to was a China milkmaid milking a China cow. As they drew near, the cow suddenly gave a kick and kicked over the stool, the pail, and even the milkmaid herself. All fell on the china ground with a great clatter. Dorothy was shocked to see the cow had broken her leg off. The pail was lying in several small pieces while the poor milkmaid had a nick in her left elbow. There, cried the milkmaid angrily. See what you've done. My cow has broken her leg and I must take her to the mender's shop and have it glued on again. What do you mean by coming here and frightening my cow? I'm very sorry, said Dorothy. Please forgive us. But the pretty milkmaid was much too vexed to make any answer. She picked up the legs sulkily and led her cow away, the poor animal limping on three legs. As she left them, the milkmaid cast many reproachful glances over her shoulder at the clumsy strangers, holding her nicked elbow close to her side. Dorothy was quite grieved at this mishap. "'We must be careful here,' said the kind-hearted woodman. "'We may hurt these pretty little people, and they will never get over it.' A little farther on, Dorothy met a most beautifully dressed young princess, who stopped short as she saw the strangers and started to run away. Dorothy wanted to see more of the princess, so she ran after her, but the china girl cried out, Don't chase me, don't chase me. She had such a frightened little voice that Dorothy stopped and said, Why not? Because, answered the princess, also stopping at a safe distance away, If I run, I may fall down and break myself. "'Could you not be mended?' asked the girl. "'Oh, yes, but one is never so pretty after being mended, you know,' replied the princess. "'I suppose not,' said Dorothy. "'Now there is Mr. Joker, one of our clowns,' continued the china lady, "'who is always trying to stand upon his head. "'He's broken himself so often. "'He's mended in a hundred places and doesn't look at all pretty. "'Here he comes now, you can see for yourself.' "'Indeed. "'A jolly little clown came walking toward them,' and Dorothy could see that in spite of his pretty clothes of red and yellow and green, he was completely covered with cracks, running every which way and showing plainly that he had been mended in many places. 
the clown put his hands in his pockets, and after puffing out his cheeks and nodding his head at them saucily, he said, My lady fair, why do you stare at poor old Mr. Joker? You're quite as stiff and prim as if you'd eaten up a poker. Be quiet, sir, said the princess. Can't you see these are strangers and should be treated with respect? Well, that's respect, I expect, declared the clown, and immediately stood upon his head. Don't mind Mr. Joker, said the princess to Dorothy. He's considerably cracked in his head, and that makes him foolish. Oh, I don't mind him a bit, said Dorothy. But you are so beautiful, she continued. I'm sure I could love you dearly. Won't you let me carry you back to Kansas and stand you on Aunt Em's mantle? I could carry you in my basket. That would make me very unhappy, answered the China princess. Here in our country we live contentedly, can talk and move around as we please. Whenever any of us are taken away, our joints at once stiffen and we can only stand straight and look pretty. Of course, that is all that is expected of us when we're on mantles and cabinets and drawing room tables, but our lives are much pleasanter here in our own country. I would not make you unhappy for all the world, exclaimed Dorothy, so I'll just say goodbye. Goodbye, replied the princess. They walked carefully through China country. The little animals and all the people scampered out of their way, fearing that the strangers would break them. And after an hour or so, the travellers reached the other side of the country and came to another China wall. It was not so high as the first, however, and by standing upon the lion's back, they all managed to scramble to the top. Then the lion gathered his legs under him and jumped on the wall. But just as he jumped, he upset a china church with his tail and smashed it all to pieces. That was too bad, said Dorothy, but I really think we're lucky in not doing these little people more harm than breaking a cow's leg in a church. They're all so brittle. They are indeed, said the scarecrow. I'm thankful I'm made of straw and cannot be easily damaged. There are worse things in the world than being a scarecrow. Chapter 21 The Lion Becomes the King of Beasts After climbing down from the China Wall, the travellers found themselves in a disagreeable country, full of bogs and marshes and covered with tall, rank grass. It was difficult to walk without falling into muddy holes, for the grass was so thick that it hid them from sight. However, by carefully picking their way, they got safely along until they reached solid ground. Here the country seemed wilder than ever, and after a long and tiresome walk through the underbrush, they entered another forest, where the trees were bigger and older than any they had ever seen. This forest is perfectly delightful, declared the lion, looking around him with joy. Never have I seen a more beautiful place. It seems gloomy, said the scarecrow. Not a bit of it, answered the lion. I should like to live here all my life. See how soft the dried leaves are under your feet, how rich and green the moss is that clings to these old trees. Surely no wild beast could wish a pleasanter home. Perhaps there are wild beasts in the forest now, said Dorothy. I suppose there are, returned the lion, but I do not see any of them about. They walked through the forest until it became too dark to go any farther. Dorothy, Toto, and Lion lay down to sleep while the woodman and the scarecrow kept watch over them as usual. When morning came, they started again. Before they had gone far, they heard a low rumble, as of the growling of many wild animals. Toto whimpered a little, but none of the others were frightened, and they kept along the well-trodden path until they came to an opening in the wood in which were gathered hundreds of beasts of every variety. There were tigers and elephants and bears and wolves and foxes and all the others in natural history. For a moment, Dorothy was afraid. But the lion explained the animals were holding a meeting. He judged by their snarling and growling that they were in great trouble. As he spoke, several of the beasts caught sight of him, and at once a great assemblage hushed as if by magic. The biggest of the tigers came up to the lion and bowed, saying, "'Welcome, O king of beasts. You have come in good time to fight our enemy and bring peace to all the animals of the forest once more.' "'What is your trouble?' asked the lion quietly. 
We are all threatened, answered the tiger, by a fierce enemy which has lately come into this forest. It is a most tremendous monster like a great spider, with a body as big as an elephant and legs as long as a tree trunk. It has eight of these long legs, and as the monster crawls through the forest, he seizes an animal with the legs and drags it to his mouth, where he eats it, like a spider does a fly. Not one of us is safe whilst this fierce creature is alive. He called a meeting to decide how to take care of ourselves when you came among us. The lion thought for a moment. Are there any other lions in the forest? he asked. No. There were some, but the monster has eaten them all, and besides, they were none of them nearly so large and as brave as you. If I put an end to your enemy, will you bow down to me and obey me as the king of the forest? inquired the lion. We will do that gladly, returned the tiger, and all the other beasts roared with a mighty roar. We will. Where is the great spider of yours now? asked the lion. Yonder, among the oak trees, said the tiger, pointing with his forefoot. "'Take good care of these friends of mine,' said the lion. "'I will go at once and fight the monster.' He bade his comrades goodbye and marched proudly away to do battle with the enemy. The great spider was lying asleep when the lion found him. It looked so ugly that its foe turned up his nose in disgust. Its legs were quite as long as the tiger had said, and its body was covered with a coarse black hair. It had a great mouth, with a row of sharp teeth a foot long, but its head was joined to the pudgy body by a neck as slender as a wasp's waist. This gave the lion a hint of the best way to attack the creature. As he knew it was easier to fight it asleep than awake, he gave a great spring and landed directly upon the monster's back. With one blow of his heavy paw, all armed with sharp claws, he knocked the spider's head from its body. Jumping down, he watched it until the long legs stopped wiggling, and he knew that it was quite dead. The lion went back to the opening where the beasts of the forest were waiting for him and said proudly, You need fear your enemy no longer. Then the beasts bowed down to the lion as their king, and he promised to come back and rule over them as soon as Dorothy was safely on her way to Kansas. Chapter 22 The Country of the Quadlings The four travellers passed through the rest of the forest in safety, and when they came out from its gloom saw before them a steep hill, covered from top to bottom with great pieces of rock. That'll be a hard climb, said the scarecrow. We must get over the hill nevertheless. So he led the way and the others followed. They had nearly reached the first rock when they heard a rough voice cry out, Keep back. Who are you? asked the scarecrow. A head showed itself over the rock and the same voice said, This hill belongs to us. We don't allow anyone to cross it. But we must cross it, said the scarecrow. We're going to the country of the quadlings. But you shall not, replied the voice. And there stepped from behind the rock the strangest man the travellers had ever seen. He was quite short and stout, and had a big head, which was flat at the top and supported by a thick neck full of wrinkles. But he had no arms at all, and seeing this, the scarecrow did not fear that so helpless a creature could prevent them from climbing the hill. So he said, I'm sorry, not to do as you wish, but we must pass over your hill, whether you like it or not. And he walked boldly forward. As quick as lightning, the man's head shot forward, and his neck stretched out until the top of the head where it was flat, struck the scarecrow in the middle and sent him tumbling. Over and over down the hill, almost as quickly as it came, the head went back to the body and the man laughed harshly and said, It isn't as easy as you think. A chorus of boisterous laughter came from the other rocks, and Dorothy saw hundreds of the armless hammerheads upon the hillside, one behind every rock. The lion became quite angry at the laughter caused by the scarecrow's mishap, and giving a loud roar that echoed like thunder, he dashed up the hill. Again a head swiftly shot out, and the great lion went rolling down the hill, as if he had been struck by a cannonball. Dorothy ran down and helped the scarecrow to his feet. The lion came up to her, feeling rather bruised and sore, and said, 
It's useless to fight people with shooting heads. No one can withstand them. What can we do then? she asked. Call the winged monkeys, suggested the tin woodman. You have still the right to command them once more. Very well, she answered, and putting on the golden cap, she uttered the magic words. The monkeys were as prompt as ever, and in a few moments the entire band stood before her. What are your commands? inquired the king of the monkeys, bowing low. Carry us over the hill to the country of the quadlings, answered the girl. It shall be done, said the king, and at once the winged monkeys caught the four travellers and Toto up in their arms and flew away with them. As they passed over the hill of the hammerheads, yelled with vexation, and shot their heads high in the air, but they could not reach the winged monkeys, which carried Dorothy and her comrades safely over the hill, and set them down in the beautiful country of the quadlings. This is the last time you can summon us, said the leader to Dorothy. So goodbye, and good luck to you. Goodbye. Thank you very much, returned the girl. The monkeys rose into the air and were out of sight in a twinkling. The country of the quadlings seemed rich and happy. There was a field upon field of ripening grain, with well-paved roads running between and pretty rippling brooks with strong bridges across them. The fences and houses and bridges were all painted bright red, just as they had been painted yellow in the country of the Winkies and blue in the country of the Munchkins. The quadlings themselves, who were short and fat and looked chubby and good-natured, were dressed all in red, which showed bright against the green grass and the yellowing grain. The monkeys had set them down near a farmhouse, and the four travellers walked up to it and knocked at the door. It was opened by the farmer's wife. When Dorothy asked for something to eat, the woman gave them all a good dinner, with three kinds of cake and four kinds of cookies and a bowl of milk for Toto. "'How far is it to the castle of Glinda?' asked the child. "'It's not a great way,' answered the farmer's wife. "'Take the road to the south. You'll soon reach it.' Thanking the good woman, they started afresh and walked by the fields and across the pretty bridges until they saw before them a very beautiful castle." Before the gates were three young girls, dressed in handsome red uniforms trimmed with gold braid. And as Dorothy approached, one of them said to her, Why have you come to the South Country? To see the good witch who rules here, she answered. Will you take me to her? Let me have your name. I will ask Glinda if she'll receive you. They told who they were, and the girl soldier went into the castle. After a few moments she came back to say that Dorothy and the others were to be admitted at once. Chapter 23 Before they went to see Glinda, they were taken to a room of the castle where Dorothy washed her face and combed her hair. The lion shook the dust out of his mane and the scarecrow patted himself into the best shape and the woodman polished his tin and oiled his joints. When they were all quite presentable, they followed the soldier girl into a big room where the witch Glinda sat upon a throne of rubies. She was both beautiful and young to their eyes. Her hair was a rich red in colour and fell in flowing ringlets over her shoulders. Her dress was pure white, but her eyes were blue, and they looked kindly upon the little girl. "'What can I do for you, my child?' she asked. Dorothy told the witch all her story how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. My greatest wish now, she said, is to get back to Kansas, for Aunt Em will surely think something dreadful has happened to me, and that will make her put on mourning, and unless the crops are better this year than they were the last, I'm sure Uncle Henry cannot afford it. Glinda leaned forward and kissed the sweet upturned face of the loving little girl. Bless your dear heart, she said. I'm sure I can tell you of a way to get back to Kansas. But if I do, you must give me the golden cap. Willingly, exclaimed Dorothy. Indeed, it's of no use to me now, and when you have it, you can command the winged monkeys three times. And I think I shall need their services just those three times, answered Glinda, smiling. Dorothy gave her the golden cap, and the witch said to the scarecrow, What will you do when Dorothy has left us? Well, I will return to the Emerald City, he replied, for Oz has made me its ruler and the people like me. 
The only thing that worries me is how to cross the hill of the Hammerheads. By means of the golden cap, I shall command the winged monkeys to carry you to the gates of the Emerald City, said Glinda. For it would be a shame to deprive the people of so wonderful a ruler. Well, am I really wonderful? asked the Scarecrow. You are unusual, replied Glinda. Turning to the Tin Woodman, she asked, What will become of you when Dorothy leaves this country? He leaned on his axe and thought for a moment, and said, The Winkies were very kind to me and wanted me to rule over them after the Wicked Witch died. I'm fond of the Winkies, and if I could get back again to the country of the West, I should like nothing better than to rule over them forever. My second command to the Winged Monkeys, said Glinda, will be they carry you safely to the land of the Winkies. Your brain may not be so large to look at as those of the Scarecrow, but you are really brighter than he is when you are well polished, and I'm sure you will rule the Winkies wisely and well. Then the witch looked at the big shaggy lion and asked, When Dorothy has returned to her own home, what will become of you? Over the hill of the Hammerheads, he answered, lies a grand old forest, and all the beasts that live there have made me their king. If I could only get back to this forest, I would pass my life very happily there. My third command to the winged monkey, said Glinda, shall be to carry you to your forest. Having used up the powers of the golden cap, I shall give it to the king of the monkeys, that he and his band may thereafter be free forevermore. The Scarecrow and the Tin Woodman and the Lion thanked the good witch earnestly for her kindness, and Dorothy exclaimed, You are certainly as good as you are beautiful, but you have not yet told me how to get back to Kansas. Your silver shoes will carry you over the desert, replied Glinda. If you had known their power, you could have gone back to your Aunt Em the very first day you came to this country. But then I should not have my wonderful brains, cried the Scarecrow. I might have passed my whole life in the farmer's cornfield. And I should not have had my lovely heart, said the Tin Woodman. I might have stood and rusted in the forest until the end of the world. And I should have lived a coward forever, declared the lion. And no beast in all the forest would have had a good word to say to me. This is all true, said Dorothy. And I'm glad I was of use to these good friends. But now each of them has had what he most desired. Each is happy in having a kingdom to rule besides. I think I should like to go back to Kansas. The silver shoes, said the good witch, have wonderful powers, and one of the most curious things about them is they can carry you to any place in the world in three steps. And each step will be made in the wink of an eye. All you have to do is knock the heels together three times and command the shoes to carry you wherever you wish to go. If that is so, said the child joyfully, I will ask them to carry me back to Kansas at once. She threw her arms around the lion's neck and kissed him, patting his big head tenderly. She kissed the tin woodman, who was weeping in a way most dangerous to his joints. She hugged the soft, stuffed body of the scarecrow in her arms instead of kissing his painted face, and found that she was crying herself at this sorrowful parting from her loving comrades. Glinda the Good stepped down from her ruby throne to give the little girl a goodbye kiss, and Dorothy thanked her for all the kindness that she had shown to her friends and herself. Dorothy took Toto up solemnly in her arms, and having said one last goodbye, she clapped the heels of her shoes together three times, saying, Take me home to Aunt Em. Instantly she was whirling through the air so softly that all she could see or feel was the wind whistling past her ears. The silver shoes took but three steps, and she stopped so suddenly that she rolled over upon the grass several times, before she knew where she was. At length, however, she sat up and looked about her. Good gracious, she cried. She was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie and just before her was the new farmhouse that Uncle Henry built after the cyclone had carried away the old one. Uncle Henry was milking the cows in the barnyard, and Toto had jumped out of her arms and was running towards the barn, barking furiously. 
Dorothy stood up and found that she was in her stocking feet, for the silver shoes had fallen off in her flight through the air and were lost forever in the desert. Chapter 24 Home Again Aunt Em had just come out of the house to water the cabbages when she looked up and saw Dorothy running toward her. My darling child, she cried, folding the little girl in her arms and covering her face with kisses. Where in the world did you come from? From the land of Oz, said Dorothy gravely. And here is Toto too. And oh, Aunt Em, I'm so glad to be at home again. The End And that is where we shall close the book on tonight's episode and close the book once and for all on The Wonderful Wizard of Oz.